So hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Salvador Munoz, and I'm the Public Programs Manager at Poster House, the first and only museum in the United States dedicated to the art and history of the poster. Tonight, we are thrilled to be joined by Daniel Joseph Watkins, one of the curators of our newly opened exhibition, Freak Power, on view at Poster House through August 15th. Tonight, Watkins will highlight artist Thomas W. Benton's collaborations with Gonzo journalist Hunter S. Thompson, as well as the larger body of political posters Benton created in the 1960s and 70s. Daniel Joseph Watkins is a writer, producer, and director based in Aspen, Colorado. Watkins runs the publishing company Meet Possum Press and serves as director of the Gonzo Gallery, where he has curated over 50 shows and manages traveling museum exhibitions. During the presentation, if you have any questions for Daniel, please feel free to drop them in the chat or the Q&A box and I will vocalize them to Daniel for you. Just make sure that you set your chat to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your witty comments and insightful questions and I don't look like I'm just talking to myself. Uh, closed captioning is available for those who need it and you can turn it on or off by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and remember, Daniel is really eager to see all of your questions, so please feel free to let them fly as they come to you. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Daniel. All right. Thank you, Salvador, and, and thanks to everybody at the Poster House for making this talk possible, as well as the amazing show and installation. Uh, it's on 23rd Street in Chelsea. I believe it's open Thursday through Sunday. Um, it's a real honor to be bringing this artwork to New York City. Um, before I start, I'm just going to give a little brief rundown. We have a slideshow. There's about 100 images. I'm going to be scrolling through them rather quickly. Um, I would love to have more questions than this be just a boring monologue PowerPoint presentation. So please feel free to interrupt. And um, I'm going to have different joints in the talk so that we can uh, have some interaction here. Um, First, I wanna bring up uh, just a little history about Tom Benton and his art and how it came to be. Um, Tom Benton was an architect. He graduated from USC Architecture School and after a short career in architecture, decided to move to Aspen, Colorado. This was his building that he built at 521 East Hyman Avenue, about a block from where I am now. This building now houses Giorgio Armani, which is uh, kind of ironic, but at one point in time was the nexus of political activism in Aspen. So I'm gonna show you a few photos of the building. He built it one story at a time, um, using ad hoc construction, local materials, Dotsero cement blocks, redwood that he had sourced from Northern California, Here's Benton's bus. You see Aspen Mountain in the background. <clears throat> this is where he came and built his home and his studio and his gallery. He abandoned architecture, but in Aspen built a few buildings, um, four in fact. Here's some of his plans. Um, you can see a lot of organic structures, very similar to some of his later artwork. Um, the reason I'm explaining some of the architecture elements is that this had a profound effect on his later career as an artist and the design elements and the clean lines and the edges. This is a, one of his architecture drawings. Here's Benton himself uh, in the early 60s in Aspen with his dog, uh, looks like a beast. And when Ben first got started in Aspen, he did commercial work, um, paying the bills, doing posters, uh, doing work for the ski school, doing work for the resort here. These are some of his earliest commercial works. You see the chop mark in the lower right, that, that's for design primarily. That was the name of his studio. Over his career, he changed that chop mark and that's what we use to date his posters. Um, so whether it be restaurants in town, events such as the jazz festival at the Hotel Jerome, Benton started his work here doing commercial posters. Um, these are some of the earliest works I've found during my research. And I'll give you a little background. This is a book I wrote, it's called Artist Activist. The book has about 
200 images that I put together with George Stranahan, who is a patron of Benton's. And a lot of these images come from that book. So <clears throat> now we're gonna get to kind of the nexus of the talk, which is political posters. Uh, in 1968, this was Benton's first political poster for Eugene McCarthy, the anti-war candidate. Um, not many people realize the origin of the peace symbol, but it's actually two semaphores that people used to use on ships with flags. And so the origin of the symbol is actually two flat, two semaphores put together, N and D for nuclear disarmament. Um, this symbol also flipped around is the ancient universal symbol for man. Um, Benton, I think personally, this is my opinion, one of his greatest strengths was his restraint. Um, cleanliness, simple messages. Um, Benton would say about political posters that, <clears throat> you know, it should be a universal meaning that everybody can understand. He said, the purpose of a poster is to graphically make a statement. Words and graphics must be directed to get across one idea universally. A poster should leave no doubt about what the artist means, and it should have the same interpretation by anybody. Um, I take a little bit different view that, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but Benton, you know, started making these peace posters as an activist in 1968. And you can see the original version behind me. These are hand pulled silk screens, serigraphs that he would make in his studio. Uh, and Salvador, feel free to, to jump the gun anytime if, if you want to interrupt me. Uh, these are some of Benton's earliest works. These are featured in the show and uh, at the poster house, Peace Now. And they weren't meant to be put in frames and put on the wall. They were meant to be art in action. And that's a really important thing. This art was meant to serve a purpose. And so in the late 60s, Aspen was a, a, a very tense place with young people wanting to fight for civil rights, wanting to fight against the war in Vietnam. And so Benton would organize protests and against the Vietnam War. And so these images here all come from uh, marches in Aspen where these posters were utilized in real life. Uh, there was a lot of interesting characters in Aspen Ben was best friends with a lot of really famous people. John Denver, Hunter Thompson, Jim Salter, a lot of activists, writers, poets, thinkers. It was a really interesting time here. And what I like to call a senius, a group of geniuses working together. So whether or not you think of Florence in the 1520s or Paris in the 1920s, Aspen in the late 60s was a place where ideas were freely flowing and a lot of people bouncing ideas off of each other, which made it a very rich environment for these posters. These posters, by the way, this montage of photos came from the new film, Freak Power, which catalogs this moment in time in Aspen. And I wanted to give everyone the feeling that these posters, you know, lived in the wild. Now, here's an important image where we have the police and the young people kind of squaring off. And this is one of the topics that we'll get into a little bit later in the talk about how there was some divisions in Aspen and Benton played a big role in the dialogue of the town. Okay, this is an important image of Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense and Tom Benton meeting at the home of Robert McNamara in Snowmass Village. Benton organized a protest where people surrounded McNamara's house with the posters. And he said, he blocked McNamara's exit and said to McNamara, we don't like your war. And just because this is a resort town doesn't mean that don't, don't think that you can get away with it. McNamara stopped and met with the protesters. He says, I'll have a talk with one representative of the protesters and see if we can come to some dialogue. And 
the protesters nominated Benton to be the one to speak to McNamara. They actually came away respecting each other and they stayed in touch throughout their life. Um, McNamara went on to write a famous book called The Fog of War, where he admitted some of the mistakes that were made in the late 60s. Hi. Daniel, thank you so much for, for sharing all these images and really contextualizing how these posters were utilized at the time of their creation. Um, I'm curious to know if you could share like uh, where a lot of how, where did you source a lot of these um, images? Yeah, so um, there's a handful of really amazing photographers that cataloged the late 60s. David Heiser was a famous National Geographic photographer. Bob Krieger was a, uh, a great photographer who focused on music, the music scene. So through my research in the books and then making the film Freak Power, we had a wealth of images because we digitized around 6,000 never before seen images. Those images made their way into the book, but also made their way into the film. And, you know, a lot of research, the Aspen Historical Society, um, you know, working with Aspen Times. Um, it, it's been a long process. Um, whenever I would find a really powerful image like this, um, you know, I would catalog it and then, um, you know, either use it in the books or the film. So that's kind of how all these images came to the surface. Great, thank you. And I just wanna point out uh, for folks in the chat, uh, Lincoln has dropped a, a fantastic article about the origins of the, the peace symbol, uh, which I'm gonna drop again, um, but it, it sort of talks a little bit in detail about uh, what Daniel touched on for anybody who's interested. Um, now I wanna transition a little bit away from the peace posters to talk about environmental posters. And um, Benton was at the forefront of this movement as well. In 1969, there was a underground nuclear blast near the Colorado River in Ruleson, Colorado, that was an experiment by the Department of Energy to free up shale gas. I don't know what people were thinking to detonate an underground nuclear weapon near the Colorado River, which the watershed has millions of people in. Well, that same thinking, Benton said, what? in the world are they doing? So instead of just maybe making a poster to question it, he decided let's do something about it. So Benton organized with other activists protests against the nuclear explosion in Rulison. And these photos are taken by Bob Krieger and they're amazing. Um, this first one I think highlights the divisions here. You've got the Western Slope kind of old time farmers on the right, you have all the kids and the young people. And in the back, you can see Benton sort of at the edge of the, the tent at the back. I love these signs, bombs, money, USA, kill nature for gas. Soon you will radiate, baby. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this image. And so this was an event that took place in Rulison ahead of the nuclear blast. Benton, you can see his VW bus here, and all of his friends went out to the test site and, you know, used the posters as, you know, politics in action, activism in action, stop the atomic blast, no contamination without representation. <laughs> the circles, the symbols, um, these all became prevalent in Benton's later work. Um, a um, lot of famous, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Carol has pointed out that uh, what, what's so interesting about these posters being used in the protests is that you can really see how effective they are, right? Even in some of the black and white images that you're pulling from newspapers and stuff, they really come through. Um, so it's clear that Benton had like a very sharp graphic eye and was using it, right, to push forward the, these. The totally. Totally. And, you know, um, it brings to mind the, the quote, you know, maybe from Picasso that said, you know, like art is war, mm -hmm. you know, like art, you know, art with a message is a powerful thing. And Benton was a genius at capturing that. Awesome. Um, and then I want to mention, 
Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just for folks who maybe aren't as familiar with Colorado geography, could you give us an idea of like how far Ryerson is from Aspen? Yeah, yeah. So Rulison was about mm, 75 miles as the crow flies west, but in a very rural western slope town. Um, it was kind of in the middle of the nowhere. And I think that that influenced the Department of Energy's desire to do this out in the middle of nowhere. They didn't think that there would be much opposition. Um, Benton and others said, no, we're gonna go. Um, this is a really important image for me personally. This is the artist, Judy Haas. She's a very famous artist from Aspen. Um, associated with John Denver and others. She has a, a poster shop in Telluride right now, uh, rock and roll posters that she adds Swarovski crystals to. <clears throat> she is a genius artist. And this is her when she was 15 years old. One of the important things about Benton is that he shared his talents with so many young people. He inspired people to become artists. I can't tell you how many people I've met over the years that say, seeing Benton do what he did and him teach and take time out of his day to teach others how to make art really inspired a whole slew of really talented artists. And I love this image because you can see Judy attaching the posters to the, to the, the pickets. And she went on to have an incredible artistic life. And she credits Benton as one of the first people to really capture that essence. Um, Here's a few of the posters together. I'm gonna to scroll through about 10 images from uh, these events where they uh, would protest. Here's the peace poster right in the middle. You can see um, Benton leading a march. And um, this is the famous ceramicist, Paul Soldner. Uh, Look out for radiation from Rulison. This is Katie Lee who made famous music about environmental issues, uh, about the Glen Canyon Dam. She was there uh, wearing the poster on her back, which I think is really amazing. Um, and then here's of course the iconic shot of Tom. He looks like a man with purpose. Um, okay, and then <clears throat> I'm gonna show a few more environmental posters uh, in this section because I think it's, uh, important. In 1970, in January, a panel was held at the Wheeler Opera House, the governor of Colorado, scientists, people came to talk about what are the dangers of nuclear testing. And this was another poster that Benton made. And as well as this poster, Earth born 5 billion BCE, died 20th century, cause man. And then finally, the uh, Whole Earth poster, which was made for the first Earth Day in 1970 in April. Uh, I think April 20, 1970 was the first Earth Day. So Benton made this poster to celebrate that event. And here we are with the, the kids marching uh, across from the Wheeler Opera House, stop pollution uh, with the Whole Earth poster. So I think you can see just from the piece activism and from the environmental activism that he was a passionate protester and a, a visionary to see, you know, to fight against issues that were important to him. Absolutely. Um, we, we have a couple of questions coming in. Um, uh, do you know if the lettering on the poster is done by hand? Yes. It, all of Benton's lettering was done with hand cut stencils. Um, one of the beautiful things about Benton's art was that he had a real eye for fonts. So for instance, here in this poster, you see the all upper case letters at the top and then all the lower case letters at the bottom. Um, he would do that by hand. He didn't use any previous fonts. Um, for some of the work with the film, that we did, we replicated some of his, his lettering because it just has this beautiful feel. Um, and it's unique. That's why it doesn't look um, sort of machine made. Yeah, absolutely, it's gorgeous. 
Um, yeah, there, a lot of people are commenting that this is one of their favorites. <laughs> um, so Definitely. you mentioned, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. Um, you mentioned that, um, you know, ben, uh, Benton inspired a lot of artists and um, sort of did a lot of like teaching and like co-working with folks. But Aston is such a small town. Were there other political uh, poster artists making work at the same time? Um, not so much. Uh, you know, I will mention there's a, a great history of artists in Aspen, and that goes back to 1947. Walter Pepke, who and his wife Elizabeth Pepke, they had a very profound effect on the town by coming from Chicago. Pepke. Pepke on the Container Corporation of America. They have some of the most amazing graphic posters ever. And when Pe Pepke invested in Aspen, he founded the Aspen Ski Company. He rebuilt the Wheeler Opera House. He rebuilt the Hotel Jerome, which had kind of fallen into you know, disrepair. And then he founded the Aspen Institute. He founded the Aspen Music Festival. And he wanted to bring artists from around the world to Aspen. And in 1947, they had what was known as the Goethe Bicentennial. And at that event, Albert Schweitzer came, philosophers, poets. And one of the more important artists that came to town was Herbert Beyer. Herbert Beyer was famous for being a Bauhaus artist. I think you can draw some parallels and inspiration in Benton's art looking at Beyer's art. A lot of clean graphics, a lot of circles, a lot of um, architecture. And the Aspen Institute was kind of a hotbed of this. Um, you know, it was an effort to make a utopia in Aspen. You know, one of the fascinating things about Aspen's history is that in the 50s, it was all about ideas, poetry, philosophy, art, music. That's what was valued. On the ski lift, you'd never ask someone what they did or who they were. It was way more sophisticated. And um, it's interesting that the transition of Aspen has become now um, more of the obsession or pursuit of the accumulation of wealth rather than the accumulation of ideas. And so Aspen in the 50s and 60s was a very special place for ideas and art. And so I think Benton came out of that. There were definitely other artists that worked here that were famous, but Benton kind of took the mantle of the graphic poster artist. And I think it was hard to challenge him because he was so talented. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's evident. <laughs> um, do, you, do you have a sense of who Benton considered like influential in his work? Um, Japanese art. I think Benton even admitted that, you know, he was really influenced by Japanese artwork. And, you know, one of the, one of the, one of his quotes that I'll read is, um, you know, he, he would say art is exploration, a subjective discovery, but he didn't discount the effect of Japanese art on his style and his, his work. Let's see, I'm, I'm um, looking for this one particular quote, but I'll just tell you that, that Eastern art was very evident. And I think the circle, and then Benton was also a ceramicist. Not many people know that. He was really influenced by Raku, Raku poetry. You know, the idea of, chance affecting art too. So I think those were really big influences. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about though is also his prescience and kind of how ahead of his time he was. Um, before we get into some of the Hunter Thompson related material, uh, I wanna also just mention that not only was he an anti-war activist, an environmental activist, but he was also a marijuana activist. Um, my friend Bob Bradis, the longtime sheriff, says the first time he met Tom was he went to his gallery to buy some dope. And uh, Benton himself, you know, was a big pro weed guy. This is one of his more famous posters. What the hell? It's only a weed that turns to a flower in your mind. 
Uh, Aspen was a hotbed for the beginning of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Law. Keith Strube founded the group. Jerry Goldstein lives here in Aspen. He's a very prominent lawyer. A lot of the funding for Normal came from Hunter Thompson, Tom Benton, and their friends. And I think that that's a really powerful thing. It took 40 years, but now we have 10 weed shops in Aspen. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a, a kind of an important thing that I'll just bring up. And then um, I think the next part of the talk is I want to get into his local political activism and his local politics. Um, do you want to have any more questions before I jump into that? Yeah. Um, does anyone have any questions before we move into the, the local? Everyone like is loving these designs, which yeah, they're gorgeous. Um... Okay, so now I'm gonna get into Benton's first local political posters were for Joe Edwards. Joe Edwards ran as a motorcycle biker lawyer from Texas. And in 1969, he ran for mayor on the sell Aspen or save it ticket. Hunter Thompson served as the campaign manager. Benton made a series of posters for Joe Edwards. And these are the hardest to find posters of, of all. Um, and at the poster house, they are exhibiting all three of these. You can see the change in colors, how powerful, just the variation in the silk screening, um, you know, it really adds a lot. You can just see um, just that subtle change is really powerful. And then this is a, a really important poster. It was, if you don't give a damn, don't register to vote. That was the core of Benton and Hunter and Joe Edwards activism. If they could get the young people involved, they could take over the government. Joe Edwards brought the first civil rights case in Colorado and that had to do with the harassment of hippies. In 1967, in the summer of love in San Francisco, there was a rumor that Aspen was Shangri-La. Beautiful housing, mountains, you could do whatever you wanted. So a thousand hippies moved to Aspen in 68, 67, 68. Well, the town people didn't like it, the business people. This is a subject of the film, Freak Power and why Hunter got involved in politics. Joe Edwards was a hero for defending the hippies. He succeeded in his lawsuit. They fired the police chief. They started to not crack down on hippies. You know, they were arresting people for playing the flute blocking the sidewalk, hitchhiking. Hunter decided he wanted to run for sheriff as an outlaw to change law enforcement and to make law enforcement more community-based and more compassionate-based. So here we have the genesis of Benton's involvement with not only Joe Edwards, but Hunter. Now, this is probably the most famous poster from the Freak Power campaign. This is the Cyclops owl that Hunter used as his, uh, on his stationery and Hunter's correspondence from Rolling Stone Magazine and others, it all has this owl. Um, you can see at the bottom, it says Hunter Thompson for Sheriff, Billy, Bill Noonan for Coroner. Really interesting little known thing is if you see there's a bullet going towards Hunter Thompson, there's a little scalpel going towards Bill Noonan. This Cyclops owl became sort of bent Hunter's sort of symbol and it shows that they're interconnectedness. And then of course, this is, oh, go ahead, Salvador. Um, I was, this is related back to the, the peace sign posters. Um, those look like hand cut stencils as opposed to like a silk screen, is that correct? Well, so here's the thing. Benton would hand cut the stencils into the silk screens. Okay. So there's a process here where you have like a, uh, a thick sheet of plastic with gelatin on top of it. He would cut the gelatin out of the, he would cut the design, hand cut the design into the stencil, and then he would impress the stencil into the silk screen and then would print multiples using the silk screen but he would hand cut the design into the silk screen. Interesting. Um, and then he he designed this poster that we're looking, the Patriots Arise, uh, and he designed the, the bird, Cyclops bird, I believe you called it. 
we've done a lot of research into where this bird came from. Hunter was using the bird as early as 67. I don't have any factual confirmation that Tom Benton created the Cyclops owl. That might have been something that was given to Tom Benton from Hunter. Um, it's a very powerful image. Um, there's a lot going on in this image and a lot of people have different interpretations. Like, is it laying an egg of change? Um, why the hell does it have one eye that's bleeding? Uh, what are the wing, you know, it, it's a, it's a freaky image. Um, and a lot of people, I mean, this image is associated with Hunter Thompson, not necessarily Tom Benton, but because they were working together, I think it, it came together in this poster. Um, I'm going to move on to probably the most famous poster that Benton did. Um, this image is the genesis of freak power. And what freak power was all about was that was the title of Hunter's campaign. When you look at this image, you see two thumbs and six fingers. Uh, unfortunately, the writer for the New York Times didn't catch this when he mentioned this, but the six fingers is a terminology for being a freak, being an outcast, being different. Hunter Thompson said, to be a freak is an honorable thing. You know, in this day and age when um, the government is corrupt and everything's going wrong in the war in Vietnam, to be a freak is actually an honorable thing. Now, in the middle is a peyote button. Um, that was for power. And so if you look with the fist and the peyote button, the fist being freak, the peyote button being power, that's where you have the genesis of the terminology freak power. And then within the sheriff star, so Benton's posters were very complex and also, you know, each part had a meaning. Um, there were many different versions of this poster that were produced over the years. This is actually a later version from the 90s um, than the original. I'll go back to the original here in a little while, but I wanted to bring that up that the, the symbolism within the poster. Okay. And how can you, how do you determine um, like what era the posters are from? Yeah, so Benton was really savvy about his designs. And so in the, um, in the book, Artist Activist, I put together um, kind of a, a bunch of different versions here. And um, what I've learned through my research is that he would print the poster, you know, 30, 40, 50 prints at a time. Then he would put the silk screen away. He would do something different. If he wanted to reprint the poster, he would change something very minor. So in the very original versions of this poster, there's no, there's no veins in the wrist of the poster. It's solid and the, and the, the fist is more rounded in the early versions. Then in the 80s, he reprinted it, he added the vein in it, and then he added the word Hunter above Thompson. So it would say Hunter Thompson for Sheriff. Then later on in the 90s, he took the Hunter off and he changed the orientation of the star. So every time he would reprint the poster, he would make a sort of new version. So I've learned over the years which era different posters are from. Um, because of the subtle changes in his work. Fascinating. Um, we had another question about um, about this uh, this design in particular. Uh, did Benton design the Freak Power Fist, Fist himself? Or do you know if it was like a collaborative thing? Like, do you know what the story is behind there? Yeah, so Benton was collaborative. Him and Hunter collaborated a lot. And we're about to get in, um, the next topic of the talk is their collaboration. I think that Hunter would come to Benton and say, here's what I'm thinking. And then Benton would put that into action. And I think there was probably blowback, 
there was probably back and forth. <clears throat> this symbol became different later on. What happened was Paul Pascarella, an artist from Taos, New Mexico, is a good friend of Hunter's and Tom. He isolated the fist with the peyote button and then he added a dagger, like a sword. And then he added the word gonzo. And this became sort of Hunter's symbol that Hunter trademarked. And that became, that became Hunter's sort of symbol. And you can see the fist and the peyote button in there. But then the gonzo, the word gonzo is in a different graphic that you wouldn't necessarily think of as Tom Benton. And that's because that was Paul Pascarella. And so what happened there was Hunter was with Paul Pascarella and they were at Owl Farm. And Hunter said, hey, I want you to kind of integrate this dagger into the fist and then the word gonzo because Hunter was famous for inventing gonzo journalism. So you can see that this, there are these different artists feeding off of this. I think that there was also a rumor that Hunter's campaign had been funded by some radical Texas outlaws that had delivered 500 peyote buttons to the Hotel Jerome headquarters. And <laughs> as a part of Hunter's platform, he said, I promise to not do peyote while on duty. So <laughs> peyote was clearly a thing going on then. And um, so I think that, you know, you have the peyote, you have the freak of, of the fist, and you have the sheriff star, you know, you have all these swirling ideas. It takes an artist like Tom Benton to bring them together and to put them into reality. Absolutely. Um, I know we have many more images to go through, so I don't, uh, I, I hesitate, uh, but there is one more uh, question before we move on. Are any of the stencil loaded screens still in existence? Do you know? Yeah, there are. And, um, I found a number of them on George Stranahan's land where Benton had a studio uh, in Woody Creek. And I still have a few of them. And there is one in this ex exhibit in New York. Um, there they're amazing. They're like works of art. Um, also in the book, Freak Power, or in the book, Artist Activist, there's an image. It's a little hard to see, obviously in focus, but you can see how he, kind of originally laid out his images with color or with um, you know words and saying this color here, this color there. And then he would, this is like a mock-up. And then he would put that into the silk screen. Unfortunately, a lot of the silk screens are kind of damaged and they've been roughed up and moved around over the years, but there are still some of the silk screens and he would reuse them so many times that you know, they'd fall apart, but some of the really nice silkscreen stuff from the 60s still works, you mm -hmm. know. Um, Benton sometimes also cut his silkscreens um, so they couldn't be used again. Uh, I've seen some of those. Um, okay, so now I want to get into the collaboration between Hunter and Tom. And um, I'm just going to mention their most famous collaboration, which was the Aspen wall poster. These were two-sided prints. They were an experiment in politics, propaganda, artwork. What it was is that Tom Benton and Hunter would get together in Benton's studio and they said they'd stay up all night. Sometimes all night would be two and a half days. And Benton would do the graphics on one side and Hunter would do the writing on the reverse. You can see the the red piece in the background here. Similarly, you can see some of the text bleeding through. These were like one page rags that they sold for $1 on the street. It was their way of politics and action and artwork in action. And they would say, it's the only way you can get a Benton poster for a buck. And people would put them up in the windows around town and then people would read the backs. And it was really important for the development of both of their art forms because Hunter and Tom Benton and Joe Edwards were the editors of the wall poster. Not having a real editor allowed Hunter to open up his mind about what was possible. This poster was produced in March, 1970. Gonzo journalism, the so-called birth of Gonzo journalism is the Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved, which took place in June of 1970. 
my personal theory on this is that the Aspen wall posters gave Hunter a vehicle to really play out his fantasies in writing. And you see the beginning of gonzo journalism in these posters. And so Benton would do the graphics and the layout and then Hunter would do all the writing. And then they used a printmaker in the basement of the Aspen Times, a guy named Fritz Stamberger, who passed away in the Himalayas. But Fritz said to Benton and Hunter, hey, I'll help you guys print these posters, you know, offset lithography, and we could print a thousand of them. I just don't want to do any pornography. So, of course, the first thing Benton decides to do is get out his Karma Sutra calendar and start submitting about a dozen different, he called them embraces, until finally Fritz agreed to print this poster, which was number two. This poster, and each poster had a topic. So for instance, this poster was all about development, how Aspen plans to grow gracefully on a diet of wildcat stew and sewer water. Um, Peyote comes up again with this poster of this bombing. Not many people know about this, but there were bombings all over Aspen. People who wanted to develop new buildings had to hire security because people would burn them down. There were five dynamite blasts on 4th of July, 1969. That's why the title of our film is called Freak Power, The Ballot or The Bomb. So for example, this bombing here, you can see this windmill. This developer wanted to build 100 homes with Dutch windmills interspersed throughout. Everybody hated it. Everybody threatened to bomb it. One night, it finally blew up. The CBI came and they said, okay, we're gonna investigate this. Well, the night that it blew up, somebody in the Hotel Jerome distributed hundreds of hits of mescaline around town. And so when the CBI was investigating the bombing, it was hopelessly, it was hopeless because first of all, there were so many likely suspects because so many people had threatened to burn and blow it up. And then secondly, when they would interview people, most of the people weren't sure where they were that night. That's hilarious. <laughs> it gives you a little insight into how radical and, and wild Aspen was then. Um, for wall poster four, this was the first double issue. They opened up it, it was like a newspaper. They sold advertising on the back. They said, if you don't want us to write anything bad about you, send in five bucks. We won't write anything bad about you. They were called non-advertisers. But the graphic layout here, you can just see immediately is Benton all, all the way. Um, and then Hunter's radical writings, Aspen, Summer of Hate, 1970, Will the Sheriff Be Killed? This image of this naked woman also comes up in the film. Hunter and Benton wanted to protest the war in Vietnam. They printed a hundred copies of the famous My Lai Massacre photo. They went around town trying to get people to put them in the windows and bring awareness to what was happening in Vietnam. They couldn't get anybody to do it because they said, you know, people didn't want to see it. So they were going to put the full length photo in this poster but instead they did a naked woman and they talk about this in the fat city fun girl versus my life for people freaked out. They made them cut her out of the poster. The cops came, kids distributing pornography, this and that huge hubbub. They said this perfectly illustrates the misplaced morality of Americans. It's not okay to show a naked woman, but it, it's okay you know, for the killing of women and children. It was a really a heavy topic that these guys were talking about. And in the film, that's a really powerful scene. Um, and then we get here to the, finally, the, the first version of the uh, wall poster five. I, I should have shown this image before because you see the rounded fist without the vein. You see that this is the original version of the poster. Yeah, you can totally see the very subtle like differences. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a poster for Billy Noonan who ran for coroner. According to Colorado state statutes, um, state statutes, the only person that can arrest the sheriff is the coroner. So 
all of Hunter's friends, they realize that, man, if Hunter gets elected, we better have someone in the coroner's office if Hunter runs amok. So Billy Noonan volunteered to run for coroner. He said the idea of being coroner scared him stiff um, or that was supposedly attributed to him. But you get an idea for Benton's graphics. This is one of the favorite posters from that Freak Power campaign. And then this is the first silk screen. This is the large version of the silk screen. And this is probably the rarest poster to find this along with the Patriots Arise. Yeah, um, everyone was saying that this is the holy grail <laughs> of the collection. <laughs> and actually a former mayor in town has one of these that, you know, it's been kind of a, a education for me working with these posters because on the one hand you find them in barns, basements, attics, tacked up on people's walls. On the other hand, you have collectors that want to pay incredible amounts of money for these posters. So this poster is kind of the holy grail and one of the ones that I rarely have. Um, let's see. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is coming from me. I, I can, can you explain the Fat City USA? I, I have a general idea, but I'd love to, to tease that out a bit more. Yeah, um, this is a very prescient poster. Um, Hunter and Tom and others, they wanted to rename Aspen Fat City because Aspen as a name is so alluring, you know, oh, Aspen, let's go to Aspen. Aspen. Yeah. <laughs> Hunter thought if we renamed it Fat City, maybe it wouldn't sound so great and maybe people wouldn't come and you'd have to rename everything Fat City Music Festival, Fat City Ski Company, you know, Fat City Gravel Pit. Um, it was an effort to stop the commodification of Aspen. And, you know, in the seventies, there was a carbonated drink called Aspen. There was a Dodge car called Aspen. Aspen became almost a victim of its own success. I, I love this poster for a lot of reasons. You can see the stars turning into dollar signs. You can see the, the, the bars of the flag running into blood. Tom and Hunter had a lot of fun with this idea of Fat City. And during the campaign, they went around and there was a crash plane at the airport. They made it the Fat City Flyer by painting on it. This is Fat City Market, which is just about a block from where I am. You know, there was all sorts of guerrilla graffiti. Anytime something said city, people would go and put fat on it. And today my friends and a lot of our kind of uh, associates still refer to Aspen as fat city. Um, and the original etymology of that terminology comes back to Hunter Thompson. That was the name of Hunter's uh, boat in 1960 that he and Paul Simonon took to the Caribbean. That's the first time fat city appears but later on it's become synonymous with, with Aspen. And here's the back of this poster, which I really love. Inns keepers amok, tourists menaced. Is Aspen doomed by strange disease? And then in the middle here, there's a, a famous photo of Hunter taken by David Heiser. That was his official campaign photo. Hunter had shaved his head so that during the debates he could refer to his opponent as my long haired opponent. But in the text here, it says, would you sell peyote to this man? Hmm. Um, so that's kind of the background there. And then this was an advertisement for the wall posters. This is, uh, you know, President Nixon with swastikas in his eyes, blood dripping from his mouth. The text on this was promoting the wall poster. And this appeared in Scanlon's magazine in the final edition. All of this got Hunter and Tom Ben in a lot of trouble with the FBI, with J. Edgar Hoover. These posters are in Hunter's FBI file. I've never looked into Tom Benton's own FBI file. Hunter's FBI file is full of Tom Benton posters and notes by J. Edgar Hoover. Keep an eye on these people, you know, and 
So, you know, and, and that comes up a lot in the film about, you know, kind of the courageousness of these guys to call people out and to depict the president of the United States like this. But then at the same time, you know, there was consequences. There was, you know, phones being tapped. There was agent provocateurs. There were threats of violence. Um, you know, it was a crazy time in American history, 1970. Um, I'm going to show just a few of the posters in the wild from the campaign. Um, this is one that ran in the New York Times article. You can see that the art was used in an action packed way. Uh, and then this is who Hunter and Tom Benton were running against. There's Hunter shaving his head. And then here's Hunter giving, or here's Tom Benton giving demonstrations to young students. Aspen High School students would come on tours to Benton Studio and he would teach them how to silk screen. This particular poster we have right now, it's called Light Fades. He's here illustrating the process and then simultaneously inspiring young people that you can make art as a career. Okay, and then I was gonna get into kind of the last stuff that I wanted to really talk about was um, Tom Benton, if you ran for office and he liked you or wanted to support your campaign, he would make you 50 political posters as a gift to the campaign. And after Hunter Thompson, subsequent candidates all wanted Benton posters for their campaigns. A Benton poster gave you instant recognition, instant instant legitimacy. If Tom Benton made you a poster, people knew you were cool. And so of course, later on, lots of people wanted to have Benton make them a poster. And he would integrate, you know, graphic symbols, a quote, for instance here, what government is best, that which teaches us to govern ourselves, Goethe. That's playing on Aspen history, the 1947 Goethe Bicentennial. Bob Broadus became sheriff in 1986, and he enacted a lot of the changes that Hunter wanted. Bob's career as sheriff was 24 years. He was reelected every year by 90%. They repealed term limits to keep Bob as a sheriff. Bob helped me write Freak Power, and he was an associate producer on the film. He's a gentle giant, a genius, a really amazing human being who really revolutionized community-based law enforcement, compassionate-based law enforcement. You know, if you did something wrong or beat somebody up or were violent or really were messing up, they'd arrest you. But Bob would also say, you know, hey, if you can get someone treatment for their drug problem, or if you can give them a second chance, um, it will make the community a better place. And, and he's universally loved. And so, and later on when Benton was struggling in later life, Bob hired Tom Benton as a deputy. Um, Bob said, you gotta hire dishwashers. You gotta hire lawyers, PhDs, outlaws. Bob liked to hire radical people to become sheriffs. That gave deputies empathy in how to deal with law enforcement problems. And we've had an amazing community here for decades because of the visions of Hunter Thompson, but then also the action of, of Dick Keenis, Bob Broadus, and then now Joey DeSalvo. So we have a really strong history of, of law enforcement. And the end of this slideshow, I, I've got a number of posters and I'm just gonna slowly kind of go through them. Um, Benton created a poster for McGovern. This is the original version. He gave McGovern a hundred posters. <clears throat> McGovern said this about Benton, he said, actually he said this about the book, Artist Activist. He said, this is an invaluable compilation of artistic expression that captures the passions and the visions of a dynamic period in our lives. McGovern loved Benton, said, hey, I gave the 100 posters away to all my friends. Can you give me 10,000 more? And Benton said, hey, they're hand-pulled silk screens. I can't do 10,000, but I'll print a new version and you can 
get a lithography company to print 10,000 and sure, I'll help you out. So his posters kind of catalog a lot of the liberal famous leaders of America. Um, so on the one hand, while simultaneously supporting progressive candidates, he was also attacking what he saw were some of the fascist elements of America. These are a lot of the negative posters, but then we'll get into some of the more positive ones. This was a civil rights poster. This is one of my favorite images graphically. Um, I like to say that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And a lot of Benton's posters are timeless. You can think about Black Lives Matters, what's going on right now in Minneapolis with the trial with George Floyd. You look at this poster, it gives you chills almost about the divisions in our country and some of the inequality that still exists. This is one of the last, uh, they continue to collaborate throughout their lives, but this was a poster Tom Benton made for the reelection of, of um, Richard Nixon in 1972. When we talk about history rhyming, you could use this in a lot of different elections. Um, Hunter loved this image so much so that he manipulated it to be the cover of his book, Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. Um, so you can see how closely they were working together. McGovern said that this book was the least factual but most accurate portrayal of the 1972 campaign. And it really established Hunter as one of the great journalists of the 20th century. Um, Some of these are repeat images, which I apologize for here. This is America backwards, Akarama. And you see the, the bold colors, the dove. This is for America's bicentennial. This is one of my favorites, um, 1976. And this is actually a very interesting font that only appears in this particular. It's almost like proto computer. Mm -hmm. um, Now I'm getting into a lot of the local posters. Uh, this is a good friend of mine, Tim Mooney. Uh, you can't solve a problem with the same mind that created it. Uh, here's Dick Keenest. Trust is a social good to be protected just as much as the air we breathe or the water we drink. Cicela Bach. Bob Bradis and Dick Keenest looked up a definition of lying and truth. Cicela Bach's amazing writing came up. Benton was a genius at picking the right quote for the right candidate. Citizens, not government, should control their destiny. Governing a large country is like frying a small fish. You spoil it with too much poking. Our task is not to fix blame for the past, but to fix the course for the future. This is a re-election poster for Herman Adele, mayor of Aspen. It's one of my favorites here. Fools' names and fools' faces always appear in public places. Gene Mooney. Ego has little place on city council. Action does. I don't belong to any organized party. I'm a Democrat, Will Rogers. Here's another JFK quote. The times of greatest change are the times of greatest opportunity, Emerson. This could be a great poster for right now. Two roads diverge in a wood and I took the road less traveled by and that has made all the difference. This is a really good one too. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Any questions coming up, Salvador? Um, there, there are a few questions coming up and I wanna give folks the opportunity 
to add them as well. So I want to ask uh, one of my own. Um, so going back to the civil rights poster, right? Um, yeah. I do think that it's interesting because a lot of the symbology, right? Uh, there, there's a little bit of an overlap between these sort of parallel movements between what was going on in Aspen and the overarching civil rights um, movement at the time. I'm wondering if aside from like this poster, was there any other attempts to address um, like solidarity between those movements or bringing them in? And then somebody else also asked like a, a, a question that sort of dovetails into that, which is, um, you know, Colorado has like a huge indigenous population. Uh, did Benton or, or Hunter Thompson ever do anything to address like indig local indigenous issues? Mm -hmm. You know, those are two great questions. Um, you know, we, we had to encounter this with the film. Aspen was largely a pretty homogenous community. Somewhat white. It, there wasn't much color in, in Aspen. There wasn't much minorities. There wasn't much, um, you know, diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of a, an issue when we were making the film about, you know, it's interesting that they were so passionate about commenting on, on these issues when maybe they weren't necessarily so prevalent of issues inside Aspen. What I would say about that also though, is that Joe Edwards and Hunter and Tom, in their efforts to help kind of the disenfranchised young people they did bring the first civil rights case in Colorado. And that really laid the groundwork for the reform of the police departments. And so, although it wasn't necessarily a racial divide at that moment here in town, the issues that they were fighting for and equality and human rights and all those things were incredibly important to Benton and to Hunter and others. And Hunter wrote about this extensively. And, and I think Tom Benton, also commented on this extensively. Um, but I think more so the issues centered around the environment, centered around the war in Vietnam, mm -hmm. centered around taking control of your own government in the community. And I think that they, they created a roadmap for how to do that. And I think that's a really powerful example of kind of politics in action is that Benton's posters were like rallying cries for issues that needed to be talked about. And I think that um, although it, it sort of was lacking the diversity here in Aspen, I think that they were all passionate about these fights and that these posters kind of illustrate their beliefs and what they thought was happening to America. Absolutely. And I would, um, and this is just my own personal like interpretation, but I would, I would say that all of those issues that they were addressing, right, also existed at the intersection of race and environmentalism or anti-war or et cetera, et cetera. Totally. Um, and, you know, uh, Benton made this poster for Willie Brown. You know, he made, he made posters for so many people for so many different causes. I think the universal thing that kind of ties them all together is progressive ideas. You know, if people had ideas about changing the system, those were things that resonated with Hunter and with Tom. Absolutely. Um, so as we're like sort of flipping through these images, we are seeing like some sort of repeated motifs or symbols um, and particularly this like hand-drawn circle seems to come up a lot. Um, is that rooted in, in Tibetan symbolism? Do you happen to know or what's, do you know what the root of this is? You know, it gets back to this, the idea of the, the circle and you know, Benton, was obsessed with the circle. You know, when I was making these books, when I made the book on Tom Benton, it was like dreaming in circles and doves. It was like, it was definitely the reuse of these ideas. And I, I think he, you know, at a certain point in time, he, he definitely just started to recycle things similar to Hunter's writing later in his career. Um, 
I wrote in the book with George Stranahan, you know, Ben created a number of fine art prints in the 60s using abstract forms and organic themes. He drew on his career as an architect, the strong influence of Eastern art and artists such as Mark Rothko and Hokusai. Ben incorporated Eastern symbols, including calligraphy, sunsets, and spirals. A solitary dove also became an integral element in Benton's art, symbolizing peace in the spirit of man. Ben's frequent use of the circle was a natural progression from his study of Eastern art. The circle with its implied perfection became a consistent element in his later work. He also incorporated natural forms such as waves and mountains and geometric shapes to add depth and dimension. So, you know, I think that, you know, people have a style that that style, you know, whether it be the, the dark moon in this peace poster, you know, it, it was kind of his, his bag, you know, I mean, that's what he did. Circles, doves, powerful imagery posters. And I think, I think once he had that style, it became, you know, who he was. And I think it also affected what people wanted too. Um, you know, in a Benton poster, you have a dove, you have the circle, you have your name, you have a quote. It, it is very almost formulaic, um, but I think that great artists do that. You know, you do the same thing. You know what you you know what you do well, and you keep doing it. Definitely, definitely. Um, again, if you all have any questions, we're we're reaching sort sort of the end of the presentation, right, Daniel? So if you have any questions, now's the time to sort of pop them in, and we do still have a few coming through. Um, so this is, this is sort of like a, a technical, like a, a little bit of nerdy question. Uh, do you know who currently owns the, the copyrights to, to, to Benton's work? Um, his family and the family doesn't want reproductions of his work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's been, um, kind of an issue because Hunter, I mean, Tom Benton was such a genius with his craftsmanship that I think attempts to reproduce it or rip it off always fall well short of his original, you know, skill and craft. So it's definitely been something where people have thought about, oh, you know, make a print, make a poster, you know, it's something that just hasn't been done because I think that it respects him and his original work and his craft, but then it also keeps the value of the originals up because there aren't being any more made you know i'm sure you could sell a million hunter thompson for share posters but having the real ones that were made by benton that were signed by benton you know those are like artifacts and um so his work um you know is that's why it's so expensive is because they're they're not making any any more of them yeah um and then do you know, uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, like when did Benton like die and did he create until the end of his life or? Yeah, so there was a poet named Joe Henry who was very close with John Denver. He wrote a lot of John Denver songs and he was a lyricist. He really encouraged Benton to get back into art. You know, Benton lived a hard life. His greatest period of productivity was 1963 to 1976. In 1976, he sold his building downtown as a part of his divorce. After that moment, he lost all of his, he didn't have his equipment set up the way he wanted to. He, he kind of built various makeshift studios. He took up painting. He started making these large color field paintings. And I could have gotten into a little bit more about his monotypes, his paintings, his later work. And he did make it in the 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. Joe Henry supplied Benton with paint, paper, materials to get him going again. And right before Benton died in 2007, he had actually a brief explosion of just the most amazing work in 2004 um, for the reelection of George W. Bush. And Benton had a real problem with Bush and the war in Iraq. And Benton, according to a legend from Georgia Hansen, the director of the Aspen Historical Society, she said that she went to a wedding 
was going to a wedding with Benton and they were kind of late and they were driving through Texas and they got on the George W. Bush interstate freeway, something like that. And Benton said, fuck that, I'm getting off this road and wouldn't, wouldn't ride on the highway. And so it shows you kind of his principles, even how outlandish they were. Um, but he made a series of posters for George W. Bush's reelection. And this is sort of right before he died. And this was a collaboration with Joe Henry. So they made four versions of this poster. By the lie, celebrate man's inhumanity to man, destruction and destroy, and patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. And these were kind of like Benton's parting shots. Um, in the poster house show, there's the celebrate man's inhumanity to man. I recently found a patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. These were some of the rarest pieces because he only made a few of them. And these were kind of right before he died. He also made um, a poster for Bob Broadus and a few other pieces, but really stopped right around 2004, 2005, and then had health problems. And then he passed away in 2007. Um, Benton also, another story to give you a little insight into him, when Hunter Thompson had his sort of famous funeral with all these famous people and Johnny Depp paid for it, the story was that Benton walked right in, took a look around and walked right out. Mm -hmm. um, he was the one who knew Hunter better than anybody. If Hunter was running amok with guns and craziness and insanity with the authorities, they would call Tom Benton in and they would say, hey, go up to the house, talk him down, tell him to shut up. And Benton would and Hunter would listen to Tom. And so that shows you kind of the nature of their close relationship. Hunter died in 2005, Benton died in 2007. Uh, I came to Aspen 2008, met George Stranahan. We cataloged 600 of his works. We wrote this book that won the Colorado Book Award. Uh, it, it's almost out of, we're almost out of copies. Um, I wanted to make this book just about Tom. That led to writing this book, Freak Power. And then we found the footage for the film, Freak Power. And Tom Benton makes various appearances in the film. And he's so well-spoken and so, he has such an intensity to him. When you see him in the film, you go, holy moly, this guy was passionate. And you can see that in his eyes. Um, and so that's kind of the, the end of his story. And, you know, this book has been a real journey because people didn't know the breadth of his work. And a lot of credit is due to George Stranahan. Um, he founded the Physics Institute here. He was a patron to Tom Ben. He was a patron to, to Hunter Thompson. He had the foresight to say, we need to find these posters. We need to catalog them. We need to preserve them for posterity. And that was George's genius. And I was just lucky to be in the right place and the right time to work with George and to be a small part of preserving Benton's legacy. Absolutely. We actually just had a comment come in that the Freak Power book is really an amazing compendium of historical information and perspective on the campaign and a particular focus of American politics at this time particularly from a local right perspective, uh, which I think is just fascinating. Um, and we have a couple of, if you're New York City based, we of course have copies of the book uh, in our shop uh, in conjunction with the exhibition. And you can also purchase them uh, uh, directly from Meat Possum Press, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'll do a couple shameless plugs. Yeah, please. We have, we have some work by Tom Benton. Back in the day, I used to have dozens of the posters. We have about maybe 15. We show them at the Gonzo Gallery website. There's also a really cool archive that I'm building. And I, and I apologize that it's not complete at the moment, but at tomwbenton.com, that is the website that I built highlighting Tom's work, whether it be his poetic works or his political works or his paintings. We have an archive on that website tomwbenton.com 
if you click archive, we're constantly adding new works. We're constantly cataloging. As new works become known, we're adding them into the folders. We're close to adding a new section on Benton ceramics, section on his architecture, section on his posters that continue to come to light. And that's what's so amazing about this whole process is Benton was so prolific. Even after 10, 12 years of working with his work, we constantly find new pieces that I had no idea. You know, just last week, a woman came into the gallery in Aspen and said, you know, I had a daycare and I asked Tom to make me a poster. And he made this poster called Happy Time School to get kids excited about going to school. And, you know, if there was any program that had a good cause, restorative justice is another one. Ben would make posters for groups out of the kindness of his heart. And I think that it's really amazing that things continue to come to light. I think we've, we've cataloged over 600 works. The archive there is living. We're gonna to continue to add to it. I, I'd encourage all the viewers to, to kind of go through and, and see his work. And then the other thing I'll mention is because the art was such kind of art in action and people didn't necessarily respect it as much as they do now, finding these works in good condition is really the most difficult thing. And so that's where my expertise comes in is I try to find museum quality examples. I try to collect works. I work with collectors and that's how this show in New York came about was working with this constellation of interesting people to who all love Tom Benton to kind of preserve and display and promote and educate people through his art. And I think, I think he can be a powerful example for also what you can do. And I think that political art in today's day and age, we had a flowering of it with say the Barack Obama campaign. There were amazing posters. There's a great book called Hope written by Hal Wirt. Uh, and he wrote the foreword of, of Tom Benton of this book. He talks a lot about you know, McGovern posters. Obama posters, but moving forward, we need new artists to kind of carry the torch of Tom Benton, to make posters for campaigns, to make posters for whatever issue that you want to fight for. We need, we need kind of a rebirth of political art. And I think Tom Benton's art can serve as a powerful template and a powerful example of how art can change and how art can be a vehicle for change and how art can be used to, to make a difference. Absolutely, that is fantastic. And such a like beautiful note, like to sort of like put, like to wrap this up. Um, and that's sort of one of the many things um, that we'll be exploring um, through programming with this exhibition is the lasting legacy of these these posters and these issues because there are like there are still people who are addressing these same issues through their artistic mediums today um and yeah thank you so much for uh daniel for for coming and sharing this very like detailed and very um insightful exploration of benton's work um and and yeah this has been fantastic it's absolutely uh, yes, thank you so much for hey, my, my pleasure. And if anybody has other questions that they'd like to uh, explore, you can always reach me, DJ at gonzogallery.com. I'd encourage anybody who wants to learn more about Benton's work to get the book Artist Activist, and then to also learn about Hunter Thompson and Tom's hijinks and Freak Power. And then it, if you'd like to see the movie, freakpower.com, Tom Benton is kind of a hero in the film. And uh, I'm around, so feel free to reach out to me if anyone has any questions. And, and thank you, Salvador. And thank you for the professional, amazing team at the Poster House. What they've done there is unbelievable. And I encourage everybody to make a visit to the show. It's gonna be up till August. And uh, it's really worth seeing. And, and I think we're all really proud of it. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daniel, for a fantastic presentation on view till August 15th, and we hope to see you there. Thank you all so much for joining us.